Yeah. 
Church, let's just go ahead and take a couple seconds to place our hand on our hearts right now and just give thanks where it is due. And that is to thank God for his only begotten son that he sent. So Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you that on this day, we get to serve you. We get to be here with you, to be in your presence, God. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to rejoice in knowing, God, that in your name, there is eternal salvation, that in your name, there is power, there is provision, there is comfort, there is protection, God. So we thank you, God. We thank you on this day. And everyone says, amen. We have a couple prayer points today that I want to share with you. And these prayer points are associated with our new building. The first one being is that we, starting on Friday, are in our next phase of going through our, our support fundraising of $670,000. So everyone say, the next phase. Something that is really near and dear to our hearts, especially for this next phase, is to once again place an action behind our faith. And what that looks like is in this next phase, starting on this upcoming Friday, that we are able, we are believing to be able to complete that next phase, the completion of those finances within seven days. So everyone say seven days. Do you have the faith to believe for that church? Come on, do you have the faith to believe for that church? Because our God can do it. Hallelujah. And so today, as we are praying right now, we're praying specifically that on this Friday, that there is this declaration, this the decree of faith, that my God, my God can do it. That $670,000 for my God is a drop in the bucket. Amen? Because it is. And so as we lift up this prayer, it says on this, on this upcoming Friday, we are decreeing and declaring that those seven days that we will see finances come into this house for that nukes building that we have never seen before. Amen? So let's lift our hands right now in a declaration saying, my God can do it. So Lord, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus Christ, decreeing and declaring that as we start this next phase fundraising on this Friday, that God, that $670,000 will come as the river flows, God, because that is my God. And I just thank you, God, in advance for the blessings that will come. I just ask Holy Spirit that the faith that comes with the action, God, that it will come to fruition because we know that with faith there is action, that you honor the action of faith because you are my Father. You are our Father. And we know that you are the Father that provides, God. You are the Father that comforts in the time of need. You are the Father that protects our house, God. And you are the Father of the future that wants to see our generations come into a place of fellowship and expansion, God. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. And the second prayer that we want is a specific personal prayer that during this next phase, we are seeking the Lord, asking, God, what would you like from me? Whether if it's finances, whether if it's time, whether if it's resources, but what are you asking from me? And as we pray this, as we are praying together from a, a pastoral standpoint all the way, all the way down throughout even the new visitors, what are we asking? I'm already going to be praying and speaking with my wife about what God has placed on my heart for this next phase. And this is just what we want to lift up right now. So everyone place their hand in their heart and let's pray this together. God, we just come before you and we are just seeking your face not from the influence of others, but from a pure connection with you, God, with you, our Father, that, God, as we are stepping into this next phase of raising, God, what do you put on our heart, God? What do you put on our heart, whether if it's finances, resources, time, God? We seek you right now, God. We seek you even in the time of need where we need, God. What would you like from us, God? Because we know, and even in the times of needs that we have, you are still there to provide opportunities for us to be stretched. So, God, we ask, Holy Spirit, how can we be stretched? How can we be of use? How can we be a resource 
to the kingdom of God. And as we pray, God, we thank you in advance for what you placed in my heart. We thank you for the clarity of hearing your voice of what you placed in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you all. Greet your neighbor on your left and right, and then place your eyes on the screen for a video. Welcome to Hungry Generation Church. Those of you who are visiting us online, we want to welcome you. And those of you who are present with us in the first sanctuary and the second sanctuary, thank you for being part of this Sunday experience here at Hungry Generation Church. If this is your first time visiting us, we want to bless you with a gift. If you haven't received one, please see our welcome team in the back table, and we'd love to get to know you. A Hungry Generation, we believe you can't do life alone, so you must do it together with somebody next to you. We have life groups happening weekly and bi-weekly throughout Tri-City area, Yakima, Hermiston, and all around the cities that we have. Scan the QR code and to find a group that best fits you, we have married couples, we have singles, young and old, all different types for you to be able to be plugged in. We encourage you not to do life alone, but with those that can stand with you and see God fulfill the dreams if happen in your life. If you want to know more about Hunger Generation Church, what we're all about, we have welcome nights taking place every second Monday of the month at 6.30 p.m. You'll be able to know who we are, the DNA of Hungry Generation Church. Once you make that decision, you will catch the vision, you will join the mission and get plugged in to the Hungry Generation community. A church is a house of prayer. So here at Hungry Generation, every day of the week at five o'clock in the morning, the doors are open to come in and spend some time with the Lord for prayer. And on Wednesday at six o'clock, we have a corporate prayer where we come and we pray for the needs of people, for the vision, and we see God answering those prayers. So join us this week. Now, as we have come time for giving and offering tithes, we want to be able to honor the Lord with our finances. As the Bible says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the best things that you have. So as we give with our finances, it's a simple way of saying, God, thank you because everything that I have came from you. There's plenty of ways to give. You can text any amount to 84321. You can go to online hungrygeneration.com slash give, or you can scan the QR code and participate in the act of giving that way. Let me pray for you. Father, I ask you, Lord, that those people that are giving, those people that have the desire to give, that you're going to bless their sacrifice, bless their tithe and their offerings, Lord, as they give and they say, thank you, Lord, for what you've given them, Lord, you begin to bless them a hundredfold in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And as the ushers are moving around collecting the offering baskets, if there's anything that you've missed in these announcements, scan the QR code and you'll be up to date with all the events and everything that's happening here at Hungry Generation. And with that, be blessed as you remain in the presence of God. Hallelujah. And you can see the different ways to give. So as the ushers are collecting the offering, let us have that thought going through our mind of what is it that God is putting on my heart towards partnering with him with this building project that God has given us. We know it is God's project. We are not desperate. We are not looking for money. We're not in need. We're not in want. But we, the Bible says, ask everything you desire in the name of Jesus, and the Heavenly Father will do it to glorify His holy name. Amen? So that's what we're believing for. We're not asked to pay for it. We're asked to believe for it, and God will do the rest. Amen? So right now, we've come to a time of testimony. This testimony today is so important, and I believe it's going to show you the transformative power of God to take one from one extreme to another, from bondage to breakthrough and glory, and give you hope that no matter what it is you've been through, no matter how bizarre maybe the darkness has been, there is light in the name of Jesus Christ. So please put our hands together as Jasmine comes forward. Welcome in Jesus' name. Please tell us your name and where you're from. Hi, I'm Otiti, also Jasmine. I am visiting from Germany. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for that. The anointing of Jesus is for all nations. Amen? Cool. So tell us, what was it that brought you here? Well, I actually came for Encounter Weekend, which was last weekend. I signed up for Life Class because I needed a touch from God. I needed breakthrough. I needed deliverance, which I always seem to need. And I came because, yeah, I came because I wanted something different. You know, when you've been living life and you're just going through the motions and you want to go deeper, and you're like, God, how do I go deeper? Well, this was the beginning of going deeper. 
Hallelujah. Can we give God a clap of glory for going deeper? So give us a little bit of background to why you needed to go deeper with the Lord. Tell us, what was, the, what was it that uh, you were going through and what God rescued you from? Well, I had been suffering from major depression and anxiety disorder for a long time, like 15 years at a stretch. And it brought my life to a standstill because I couldn't function. I graduated and I went home and that was it. I couldn't really do much else. In 2013, I was suicidal and I nearly took my life. I was on medication. I nearly took an overdose that night. It was midnight. I used to have physical tremors so bad, like people with Parkinson's. And I didn't think I could make it. I was away from God at the time and I just felt something tell me, go take a shower. There was this voice in my mind. Taken over those, you have peace. Yeah, for 30 seconds before the torture starts. And I went upstairs, I took a shower. I started thinking of all the people who would be devastated if I were to kill myself. My mom, my sisters, my dad, my best friends. And I was like, okay. I felt, I didn't know. Looking back, it was Holy Spirit. He said, give your mom 24 hours. And I'm thinking, okay, one more day I can do that. Well, I'm still here, you know. And Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus who conquers death by the power of the resurrection. So tell us a little bit more before we go on with this. Um, you said chronic depression and anxiety for about 15 years. And this ultimately led to you being suicidal. But before then, how did it affect you on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, it was hard to take care of myself. Let me rephrase that. I couldn't take care of myself. I couldn't cook. I could hardly do any chores because... The bondage was so strong, I would have trouble walking, trouble talking. There were times I couldn't hold cutlery, I couldn't hold cups, like the way Pastor Casey is holding his cup. I couldn't do that because my hands would just like spasm all the time, my body would spasm. So it was really hard, and because I was away from God, like I didn't know it was bondage, I didn't know there was a way out. I just didn't know, so one day it looked like the next, looked like the next, looked like the next. Sorry to interrupt you, but you said you want to go deeper with God. We want to know the depth of what God has done for you as well. So tell us, what was it that was going through your mind that would trigger these kind of spasms, this fear, and this crippling anxiety not to be able to cook or take care of yourself? Actually, looking back now, my mind was blank a lot of the time. I didn't realize it, but it was just blank, and then I would start screaming. There were just these thoughts of, you're going to die, nobody loves you, nobody cares about you, everyone leaves, this, that, and the other, and I was just like, where is God in all this? Eventually, I did find my way back to him. I read it kid in my life. I started reading my Bible. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit without anyone praying for me. And I was just like, God, I want to know who you are, because if you're real, I need to know, because I am lost, I am broken, I do not know the way. And eventually, I... Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together for the living God. No matter how bad the darkness is, there is light in the name of Jesus Christ, and that light can shine on you as it has shone on Jasmine. Amen? So... You are telling us, I really want to get to the, the core of this, not just a matter of, uh, of fear, but why, why would picking up cutlery, holding a bowl, why would that, what would that do to you? Um, I just didn't have the physical strength for it. I didn't have the capacity, and I was afraid of going into the kitchen. I was afraid of cooking because there were all these voices. You're going to cut yourself. You're going to cut off your finger. You're going to pour boiling water on yourself. You're going to scar yourself. So... Because of that, I couldn't really eat, and I was skinny for a long time. Well, I'm still skinny, but you know what I mean? Like, it was just hard to eat. So I would be home, I would be hungry, or not hungry, but I wouldn't eat because I'm like, there's no one home. I don't trust myself to go into the kitchen and do anything, so I'll just wait for someone to come back. And it was really hard until last year when everything started shifting. Hallelujah. So that was the, the degree, the extent to it, which pushed you finally to sorts of suicide, like you mentioned earlier. So that was when you moved in with your mother and gave her 24 hours. And so from there, mom has been taking care of you basically, right? Yeah, I was already living with her, but I was upstairs in my room when the thought came, give her 24 hours. So I had been living with her and yeah, that's how I'm still here. Because if I wasn't living with her, I would be dead. There is no question about it. If I didn't have someone that loved me to hold on to, yeah. So now tell us, um, what was it, how did God bring you out of this and give you the breakthrough that we see has brought you to the presence of God here at Hungry Generation? 
Well, like I said, I came back to church, I found God, and I joined Hungry Gen Online in February 2022. And since then, you know, things have been changing, strongholds have been breaking. Last year, before the 21 day fast, in November, I went to my local church, we had an all night prayer service, and I just started praying and I was like, I needed to go beyond where I was because I still wasn't cooking, I still couldn't take care of myself. And the next day, my mom was in the kitchen and she was tired and about to fall into the oven because she was so tired. And I just had a voice tell me, why don't you go help her in the kitchen? I'm like, it's Saturday, it's my Sabbath, this and that. And I'm thinking, what kind of Sabbath are you doing when your mom is so tired and you could help her? So I go and I start chopping vegetables for the first time in like eight years. And I'm thinking, who is this? Because I didn't have that, I didn't have that courage before. And then in January, there was the 21-day fast, which I did. And by the end of that fast, I was cooking. And I'm like, what is happening to me? You know, because it was just so incredible to go from eight and a half years of being unable to do anything in the kitchen, to chopping vegetables, to making my own meals, to becoming vegan, which I didn't know was going to happen. But okay, you know, it happened. And now I cook for myself. I cook for my family. And it's just been like a total 180. To God be the glory. From crippling anxiety and depression where you couldn't even cut vegetables or take care of yourself, make food for yourself, you are now making food for yourself, making good life decision choices for your health, for your body, and are you cooking for your parents as well now? Yes, I am actually, because when I started eating the vegetables, okay, let me just digress really quickly. During the 21-day fast, I did two, three-day water fasts, and there was a live stream Pastor Vlad did on food. I don't even remember what he said, but at the end, I was feeling really convicted. So I started praying, and Holy Spirit gave me a prayer. Looking back, I would have been like, girl, say the prayer, but you're not ready for what's coming. And I said, Lord, if there's any craving I have, any lust I have for sugar, cream, oil, fat, I need you to take it away. If it's hindering my relationship with you, I need you to take it because I can't do it on my own. Because, you know, the burgers, the fries, the chicken, bring it. You know, like, <laughs> I couldn't let it go on my own. I'm just being real. And I was still fasting, so, of course, I wasn't eating all that stuff. I was on broth and vegetables. After the fast, maybe like a week after, my mom is like, so, you're going to eat regular food now? I'm like, I've been eating regular food. She's like, no, I mean regular, regular food. I'm like, okay. So, I tried a croissant. I was so cranky the next morning. I'm like, what is this? Because of all the sugar and stuff, that's how it just affects me. So... Slowly, I started phasing stuff out. I didn't know I was going to become fully vegan, but here I am. And the energy I have, I don't have cramps anymore. I can sleep. I can concentrate. I don't need to take magnesium supplements for the cramps because before I was taking them daily, and I haven't had any since January, and this is April 21st. So, yeah, it's been real. How else can you say Jesus Christ has completely transformed my life from one extreme to the other. Amen? Yes. And now we can see you here in the presence of God. And just a, a week ago, or about that, we went through the Encounter Retreat as part of Life Class. So tell us just a, a gem about why you joined Life Class and why you came to that, all the way from Germany. I joined Life Class because I felt like I needed a breakthrough because I had come to a standstill. I... Last year was really hard, so for like six months straight, I was frozen in grief, and I started thawing out during the 21-day fast, but I just wanted to get the next level of breakthrough for me without waiting for someone to come and be like, God said this and God said that. So I signed up for life class a day before registration ended, and when I found out about Encounter Weekend, I told my mom, and she said, do you want to come? I was like, yes, but. She said, but what? It's on a different continent. It's in four weeks. She said, actually, it's in six weeks. If you want to go, go. So I came and I told God, I need you to touch me. I need you to mark me this weekend. I didn't come here just to come and sing and jump and shout. I came for, which is always good. I came for a touch from you and I'm not leaving without it. I wasn't ready for the touch I would get. I was not ready for the raw power without cell phones, which was amazing by the way, because there's nowhere to hide, right? When you don't have cell service. And I experienced God in a deeper way. Because it wasn't just when we're all singing and praying, because when you're singing and praying, you're riding with everyone, right? But when you are by yourself, and Holy Spirit comes and sits with you, and it's like, we're going to handle this, and this, and this. So, I would say to anyone who 
is considering Encounter Weekend, and considering life class, considering anything really, if you come, he will touch you. But you need to come. And you need to be willing to leave it all on the altar where there are no cameras, where nobody's going to be like, ah, in Jesus' name. You need to be ready for him to touch you. I'm sorry, I had to. I'm sorry, I had to. To God be the glory. Jasmine, thank you so much for your testimony. We've seen the beginning of breakthrough in your life. We've seen this next step, and we know the best is yet to come for you in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may have your seat. Thank you so much. Without any further ado, please help us welcome Pastor Vlad. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap offering. In the second sanctuary, welcome everyone. We love you, appreciate you. Everyone watching us on YouTube, can we give a round of applause to everybody in the second sanctuary online? If you're on YouTube and Facebook, let us know where you're tuning in and watching from. Uh, maybe you've missed this uh, wonderful lady all the way from Germany. So it's not that she lives in America and originally is from Germany. She lives in Germany. And she came to this thing that we have called life class. What is a life class? It's about seven weeks where we meet on Monday nights for one hour, learn more what it means to be a Christian. And then we go to this thing that she just mentioned. It's called a retreat. It's three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. This happened last weekend. If I say life-changing, I'm not exaggerating. Every person who has went there will say exactly the same thing. And so for those of you who've never went, you're like, yeah, I kind of know all there is to know respectfully. You don't. <laughs> the, one of the benefits of that life class is that your phone stops working 15 minutes before you get there. Maybe that has something to do with improving our receptivity to the Lord. <laughs> so it's right behind me. If you have never been through life class and you're part of Hungry Gen, please find time to join that so you can just grow deeper in the Lord. Amen. I am super excited what the Lord has been doing. Some of you guys have been seeing in the last two weeks, we have been in eight high schools. So you're going to see some B-rolls right behind me from high schools. Uh, come on, Joe. Eight high schools. We reached about 1,400 students. 153 students said yes to Jesus in our eight high schools. Come on, church. You can do better than that. I don't know if it's... Uh, 8 a.m. service or 9 a.m. service. That's something to shout about. 1,500 students heard the message of Jesus, had a slice of pizza, and 153 raised their hand and said, I want to follow Jesus. Come on. So powerful that tonight we are having our youth service in the parking lot. The reason why there's less parking spaces is because that place, that whole place is going to turn into a crusade. I love doing crusades in Mexico, Panama, Africa, and India, but nothing is better than doing crusade in Pasco. So we've been sowing seeds in high schools and tonight we're going to reap even a larger harvest where all these students are coming to a parking lot service. It's going to be incredible. So parents, be praying for that because the Lord is going to do some wonderful, wonderful things. And so you're going to hear a little bit more next Sunday where you're going to watch actually a full video of this. But we celebrate that. This is where people say, you know, um, you know, when we give, sometimes people make a remark. I don't know where my money is going. You're seeing right here. Into the building, into the next generation. Um, not just to improving the stage, but we want to improve the state of what's happening in our city, in our generation. With our giving, with our prayer, and with our fasting. Amen. This week though, is we have our annual pastors conference. So once a year, we gather local pastors, actually I would say not local pastors, pastors around the world. We limit it to 250 people, so it's already sold out. And then we have about 330 that will join us online. And so we are believing that the Lord's going to use this time to touch pastors. This next seven days, I'm going to ask you for two things. I'm going to ask you to pray that God's going to mark every pastor that comes here, that their youth ministry is going to explode, the people are going to start getting saved, deliverance will break out. But I also want you to pray next seven days that the Lord is going to release favor and that we will raise $670,000 in one week. 
Hey, the Bible says, ask anything in my name. We're not asking that for ourselves. We're asking that for his kingdom project. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Financial times are tough right now. Times are not easy. Times are difficult. That's why I'm asking you not to give first. I'm asking you to believe first. If we can combine our faith and then we pray in faith. And then next Sunday when you come, you ask the Lord, what would you have me give as well? And if God says nothing, don't give anything. If the Lord puts something on your heart, just respond to the Lord. All of us, including our team, are going to pray about that. Because that building in Kenwick over there, it's going to not happen because some big millionaire, billionaire gave a check. But because every person prayed, believed, and it's the work of our faith and the work of our labor. Amen. Amen. So next Sunday, come with expectation. We will have a guest speaker, Pastor Marco Garcia from The Way Church. Uh, he will be uh, sharing, but it's going to be a huge celebration. Our prayer line deliverance service is happening on Saturday. So this weekend is going to be buck wild. But we like it like that. Amen. If you're first time to Hungry Jan, you're especially welcome. We appreciate that you are with us here today. I'm going to preach the most difficult message I have ever preached at church in the last 20 years. But I believe it's one of the most important messages that we need to preach in church today. It's most controversial topic politically and online. And it's the topic of abortion. Now, ever since my son was born, things changed for me and how I view babies. <laughs> Joe? Samuel, work with me Joe. Would you show the previous photo of how he looked in the ultra, uh, the previous one? Yeah. That's him in the womb. Let's bring the other one on the earth. Yeah. The same guy. I remember first time hearing an ultrasound. No wonder they said that once a person considering an abortion has an ultrasound things just change there's something just changes I remember um, seeing images um, of him being already um, in the womb and then you know having him born and you know watching caring for him for the last 32 days which has been a great morning joy of my life before presenting this message I also wanted our church not just to be known for what we are against but what we're for. As a church, we support Hope Medical Clinic, which is a local faith-based nonprofit community medical clinic providing compassionate, evidence-based healthcare services. Out of God's love for His creation, they educate and empower people to make informed decisions which enable each person to embrace health and life. They provide free lab-grade pregnancy tests and nurse consultation ultrasound at no charge to determine the gestation and availability of the pregnancy. So at church we believe in babies. We want to have a lot of them. We want to be intentional that our children are raised up in the teachings of God. We want to have programs and we want to have ministries that are financed really well and, and really have good leadership there to help our children grow in the things of God. We want to go into schools to impact the children. Now if you're not a believer here today and you're visiting us today, I would like to give you also why we as Christians stand for life. If you are a believer and you just simply been those people who are like, yeah, I'm against abortion, I'm for pro-life, I will give you a biblical, also some common sense understanding why Christians and to them this matters so much. For President Joe Biden, the issue of abortion is the central issue of his campaign strategy. Donald Trump, who helped to elect three Supreme Justices that helped to overthrow Roe versus Wade, has shifted his position. Yes, let's give the Lord a clap offering for the overthrowing of the Roe versus Wade. And it's not just us to celebrate, a lot of babies celebrate too. But Donald Trump changed his position lately to whatever helps him to get elected. So it's a political issue in the area of politics. And maybe some of you will say, well Vlad, you shouldn't be talking about this because it's a political issue. 
for a baby, for my son, life is not a political issue. It's life or death. And so it's not a political issue. It's a theological issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's not about church is trying to get into politics. It's that politics became religious. Before politics used to protect our rights and our property. Today they decide who is a man, who is a woman. Today they begin to infringe on defining marriage. They used to just pave roads. Today they open doors to male bathrooms or female bathrooms by opposite sex. Politics have become more religious than before. It's not that the church became more political. It's that politics became more spiritual. And so my desire today isn't trying to appeal political, but to bring the conviction from God's Word. We must understand as a Christian, as a believer in God, someone who believes that I was made in the image of God, who has God, the way you view God determines how and what you value. For example, if you, there, if you view there is a God, it determines how you value another human being who carries the image of God. Also, if you believe there is a God, it enforces values set by God. That marriage is sacred. Sex is for the purpose of pleasure, procreation, protection, comfort, intimacy. And it's supposed to be within marriage. Now we live in a generation today that's described in Judges and there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their eyes. When you reject God as your king, you don't have a proper view of God, you become a God to yourself. Your carnal nature, debased mind becomes the one that instructs your values and your view of humanity is no longer based on God but on convenience. So if it's something is convenient, that enforces your values. And so as a Christian, my value system doesn't come from my moral compass. It comes from the divine origin and He imposes that on me. When a culture rejects God as His supreme Father, the Creator, what that culture is left with now, because when you reject God as the source of truth, the place of God never remains vacant. That place is quickly occupied with something or someone else. Except whoever takes the place of God is never as nice, as kind, sacrificial and loving and forgiving as God. It's not as omnipotent, omniscient um, and omnipresent as God. And whoever takes the place of God will demand certain things. May I submit to you, our culture has a God. This God is sex. And this God demands a sacrifice. The sacrifice of a fetus. Satanism is not worship of Satan. It's a worship of self. The book of Satan has this thing that says that do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Meaning do what you want is the summary of what it means to be a part of a church of Satan. People think that the church of Satan, the temple of Satan is about worshiping the devil. Actually no, it's about worshiping yourself. The devil didn't become the devil because he worshiped the devil. The devil became the devil because he worshiped himself who was the devil. What begins to happen is that when you reject God, you become your little mini God. With that comes power becomes God, sex becomes God, greed becomes God. And these gods, they're mean, they're nasty, they're not loving and they're not kind. And they demand a sacrifice. I'll prove it to you. Pagan cultures always sacrifice children because gods demand a sacrifice. Ancient gods like Molech and Baal were associated with the sacrifice of human beings, particularly the sacrifice of children. Abortion is not a new thing. The idea of attacking innocent little children and offering them to a god is not new. It's been around the world for a long time 
ever since men rejected the dominion of God. Even God's people like Solomon offered babies to Molech. How could someone being a wise king build an altar to Molech? That's why I see Christians today and some of you will have a problem with me today because I will step on your woke progressive Christianity. Because we worship God but we think like the world. The Bible says offer your body as a living sacrifice and then it says this, do not be conformed to the ways of this culture but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Christianity is not just about coming to feel God. You gotta think like Him. And that's why what we do is that we embrace the salvation but we don't embrace the truth that comes with salvation that changes the way we think. Early Christian apologist Marcus Minusis, he said this, so they commit murder before they bring forth and these things surely come down from the teachings of their God. So 2000 years ago, Christian apologists said these pagan cultures bring children to their gods before they're born because that's what their gods demand. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn in his book, the return of the gods. He mentions three main gods of the Old Testament that had different roles and how these gods are influencing American culture. The first one is Baal and Baal was the one that really would replace the God of Israel and become the source of truth and uh, Rabbi Jonathan would say that Baal promises freedom for those who depart from God. After him comes Ishtar and Ishtar is the sex god. She would offer instant gratification and fulfillment for those abandoning moral safeguards. And after Ishtar comes Molech. Molech promises to grant blessings of unhindered life if we only feed our children to him on the altar. Ancient Molech sacrifice is no different than modern abortion. Let me give you the comparison. Ancient practice, parents would sacrifice their children, often involving priests in killing. Now if that sounds barbaric, we are legalized. We have legalized that in the United States. In modern practice, physicians perform abortions. Ancient methods, children were pierced, cut, crushed, left to die or burned. Modern, similar methods are used. Children are pierced, cut, torn apart or chemically burned. In ancient times, wealthy brought children from the poor for the sacrifices, disproportionately affecting the poor. Some of you don't know this, but higher abortion rates among the poor and black communities, drawing the parallels to ancient discriminatory practices. Ancient justification, how could you justify killing children? Sacrifices were made for societal benefits, believed that it will gain favor with the gods. Abortions are seen as benefiting the society by enabling women to pursue their careers and clinics profit from selling fatal tissues. Ancient views were that child sacrifice was not only legal, it's holy. Modern view is abortion is legal, often defended as a sacred right, likened to ancient priests. Modern abortion providers benefiting corporations and political leaders are seen as ensuring continuous practice. This is what a, what a Greek writer said about people offering sacrifices to gods. Out of reverence for Kronos, Phoenicians, when they would seek to obtain great favor, vow one of their children, burning it as a sacrifice to the deity, if they were especially eager to gain success. Make no mistake, maybe you're not in that category today, but people, abortion is viewed as three different ways. It's a ritual, sacred ritual. It's a right, meaning my body, my choice, or it's, it's a sin. Our culture today views it, some extreme cases where it's a sacred right, people will die for it. And others view it as it's a choice or I will never do it, but we should never impose our morality on other people. Jeanette Paris, who is psychologist, therapist and author of many books, she's a retired professor at Polit 
Pacifica Graduate Institute and an author of the book called The Sacrament of Abortion. She likens abortion to a sacred act, a sacrifice to Artemides. She says this in her book, our culture needs new rituals as well as the laws to restore abortion to its sacred dimension. Abortion is a sacrifice, she said. It's a sacred act. She says it's not immoral to choose abortion. It's simply another kind of morality, a pagan one. Sarah Terzo said abortion is a major blessing. It's a sacrament in the hands of the women. Now, you know who else sees abortion as a sacred ritual? The members of Satanic Temple. The Satanic Temple, on behalf of its members, objects government interference with abortion access and contests that the laws that impede our faith in bodily autonomy and our ability to perform, this is what they call abortion, our religious abortion ritual. See, abortion for the church of Satan, the temple of Satan, is a sacred ritual. You know how we have the Holy Communion? That is what it's likened to. So instead of us trusting in His blood for our atonement, we offer the blood of our children to appease who? Ourselves. The God, the dark God of Molech. There was a king in the Bible, his name was Josiah. He led a nation back to God. And one of the first things he had to do is destroy the altars of Molech. If a nation returns back to God, its values will change. It will no longer value destruction of weak and vulnerable, but it will defend the weak, the poor, and the vulnerable. When a nation returns back to God, now our goal today isn't to turn our nation to God. My goal here is to turn your heart toward God. And my desire is not just to turn your heart toward God, especially if you're a young person and you recently gave your life to Jesus and this topic triggers you already. I know that in this room, size of this room in Second Sanctuary, there are people who've committed abortions. And this topic just brings up memories and maybe brings guilt and condemnation. That is not the point of me preaching this message. My goal isn't to bring guilt and condemnation. Those of us who got saved, our past life is over. But we can't think on the level of our past life. We got to think on the level of God's truth, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us. Twenty-five percent of global population lives in countries restricted to abortion services. Abortion is legal in most of the parts of North America, Europe, Asia and Australia, but it's illegal in Africa and South America mostly. Soviet Union was the first modern state to legalize on-demand abortions under Vladimir Putin. I should kind of tell you right away that this is not a good thing. In the 20th century, China enforced involuntary abortions to control their population. On January 22, 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court Roe v. Wade decision recognized constitutional protection for women's right to choose abortion under the right to privacy. When Donald Trump became the president because he elected three Supreme Court justices, they eventually on June 24, 2022, overturned Roe v. Wade. According to Planned Parenthood, abortion is a medical procedure that ends a pregnancy. But biblically speaking, abortion is more like an act of violence that kills the smallest and the weakest innocent human being. I want you to hear from comedian Bill. He's liberal. Is not Christian and I believe and I respect him for giving an honest definition from the cultural perspective on what abortion is. I can respect the, the absolutist position. I really can. I, I, I scold the left on when they say, oh, you know what? They just hate women, people who aren't pro-life, they, pro-choice. They just, they don't hate women. They just made that up. They think it's murder, and it kind of is. I'm just okay with that. I am. I, I mean, there's eight billion people in the world. I'm sorry, we won't miss you. 
That's my position on that. What? That's quite harsh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not is sure that not your position? <laughs> if I your think this is the honest um, liberal who's ever came out and said that. Sad, grievingly sad, but at the same time, he said it's kind of a murder because it is. He said, I'm just okay with it because we won't miss you. Now, for a Christian, number two, life begins at conception, not at convenience. To call abortion a health care is like calling slavery and employment. It's not right. Now people will say, when it comes to the issue of abortion, everything hinges on one, this one thing. When does someone become a person? Because people who advocate for pro-choice or pro-abortion would say that, you know, it's not really a person. They become a person and nobody really knows when someone becomes a person. Science actually cannot answer that because that's not a scientific question. That's a philosophical and that's a theological question. That's why we don't look to science to determine when you become a person. Now, one of the arguments is you become a person when you come out of the mother's womb. So anything that you were there in the mother's womb was not a person. Or when you take your first breath is when you become a person. And some people will actually use the Bible and say, because the Bible says that God breathed his breath into Adam and Adam became a living soul. So you're not a living soul until you take your first breath. The problem with that is that the the creation of Adam was not the birth of Adam. Adam didn't have a mother. And Adam didn't have a belly button, I think. <laughs> Adam's creation shows how the humanity started. It does not show how humanity continues. Because none of us are born the same way Adam was created, right? So Adam's creation cannot be used to advocate that that's when the personhood began because Adam didn't, was not an embryo, he was not a fetus, he didn't have a birth and Adam didn't have a childhood. So you cannot advocate Adam's creation as a sign that that's when you become a person. In fact, a child can breathe through the, um, through the umbilical cord in the mother's womb. The, the child has a heartbeat. The child already has its own DNA. The child has its already distinctiveness in it. Our Sammy was burping for a long time in my wife's womb and we could feel it. So to argue that you become a person when you are born is deeply flawed. What about the ones that are born prematurely? Are they persons or can we execute them until they are 40 weeks or 39 weeks old? And I'm gonna just throw in a few things. A fetus is a person with potential, not a potential person. Calling an unborn child a clump of cells is technically accurate but inadequate because this description can apply to every human adult being. We're all a bunch of cells. The main difference between an unborn and a newborn child are location, size, dependency level and development stage. Newborns still growing and highly dependent are no more valuable than when they were in the womb. Embryology shows us that from conception forward, embryos are living human beings. At fertilization, a child's DNA and traits like gender and appearance are set. It just needs nine months in the uterus to develop into a fully functioning human. So we don't become human beings when we're born. We are human beings, even in the womb. Our functions grow, our weight grows, our abilities, we begin to unlock them more and more. But even when a child is born, leave it by itself, it will die. It needs to be cared, it needs to be changed. It can't do anything by itself. And so to argue for this position that it's not a person, it's just a clump of cells is inaccurate. It could have been maybe accurate hundreds of years ago when we didn't know what was happening in the womb. It could have been accurate if the Bible wasn't explicit about the life of a person inside of the womb, which we're going to get to in the moment. A fetus is not an organ of a woman's body, such as liver. It's an actual person. My body 
my choice. A hundred percent. I agree. But it's somebody else's body and it's their choice. Babies never chose death. Somebody chose that for them. A fetus is an individual attached to its mother only at a placenta. Being inside of something is not the same as being a part of something. Everyone's inside of the building. You are not a building. When we demolish the building, we don't demolish you with it just because you're here. You can't justify killing an uninvited yet harmless house guest or an unwanted person in your body. As a visitor in the womb, an unborn child deserves hospitality, not death. No single, the one single choice to commit an abortion robs a baby of a lifetime of choices. Babies never choose to die. And people who fight for my choice, my choice, respectfully, where was your choice to prevent the pregnancy in the first place? Why did you fail to exercise your choice knowing sex leads to pregnancy? And now punishing someone who will never be able to make any choices because of one choice that you made. It's not fair. It's not right and it's not moral. Uncertainty about the status of the fetus justifies caution, not abortion. Let's just say that you're here and you say, Vlad, I don't agree with you still. All of these are just good statements. You're emotionally manipulating people. I don't agree with that. Let's just say that we don't know when a person is a person, embryo state or a fetus state. Let me give you an example. Let's say you go hunting with your son. You go into the woods, both of you separate, he takes a different position, you take a different position. And you notice that position, the direction he went to, there's some movement there and you're not certain if it's a deer or if it's your son. Uncertainty whether it's an animal or a person, does that warrant pulling the trigger or does that warrant caution? No one in the right mind We'll say, we'll get trigger happy. No, you would rather miss a deer just so that you don't execute your son. So if you're not certain, even though there's so much signs pointing to the fact that every person starts as an embryo, as a fetus, and it's not a person that goes into different phases and becomes a person. It's the same thing that you pull out from the womb and you start seeing it's the same person, same one. Nothing has changed, just the location. That's all. If you're not certain, that warrants caution. Not yelling to advocate death. We seek to alleviate suffering, not eliminate sufferers. But it's better to kill this fetus because what if it's going to be born with a deformity? You see the interest rates. You see how hard life is. I'm going to remove this fetus to save it from all the misery. Now, if you're not a believer, I understand your reasoning. If you're a Christian, that reasoning not only is deeply flawed, it's anti-biblical. The Bible doesn't give us right to eliminate sufferers. If that argument is true, Let's prevent this baby, this fetus from ever encountering suffering. What if we use that line of reasoning to go and wipe out hospitals today? What if we take all the elderly people with Alzheimer's, people on breathing machines, all the children that are deformed, people with Down syndrome and say, you know what, let's just alleviate their suffering by getting rid of them. That would be immoral. Not only that would be ungodly, that would be anti-human. Nobody would do that. Yet that line of reasoning is applied to the most defenseless, defenseless, weakest member of our society. What we do as Christians is we help those that suffer. We create medicine. We find ways. We find methods to make their life easier. This world is hard. It's not easy. But God gives us His grace to help the sufferers, not exterminate them.
Abby Johnson from a Christian family, a pro-life, signs up to volunteer at Planned Parenthood, thinking that the goal of the Planned Parenthood is to prevent pregnancies. She's a Christian from a Christian background. She starts to work from Planned Parenthood and eventually becomes their director. There's a movie that came out on that. She then starts selling birth control, pitching ideas about abortion to young girls. And director shows her dead baby body parts. She's not upset. She gets pregnant, takes the pill, terminates the pregnancy. There's a part in the movie where a baby is, it happens during abortion, where the doctor is going inside of the womb with a vacuumer to gently, that's what Planned Parenthood says, uh, remove the baby. Pretty much it's going in to vacuum the baby out and turn it into just a, a liquid blood. And this Abe, Abe, she sees this on the screen when the baby in the womb is clinching and fighting away and trying to get away from the metal pieces that the doctor is trying to put into its womb. Joe, did you put that video? And I want you to just see it for just a second. This is not to make anybody's card and stuff. So, but when the doctor puts in and then the baby is fighting for it because the baby wants to live, not die. And that encounter changed this woman's life. And she went from being a director at Planned Parenthood. You see the baby fighting, trying to get away from death because babies don't choose to die. They want to live. And so I want to encourage you today not to advocate, think or vote for people on Molex payroll. This is what she says, suddenly the reality of this baby who's trying to avoid doctor's painful tools becomes clear to me. And now, of course, she gets in trouble with Planned Parenthood. Eventually, lawsuits and everything begins. Now, I understand when Roe versus Wade got overturned, local news media was in the front of our church and they right away asked me a question. So you stand for pro-life. I said, yes, I am. What about those who get abused? No, no, not this one. That's not a local media. What about those who are conceived in rape, in abuse and that's people love to use that argument first of all the chances or those cases are so rare but they still happen this is what I want to say the guilty party should be punished for a crime not an innocent unborn child in Deuteronomy it says fathers shall not be put to death for their children nor shall children be put to death for their fathers a person shall be put to death for his own sin. To argue as tragic, as barbaric, as painful the circumstances of somebody's conception is, it does not warrant their termination because of how they were conceived. Circumstances surrounding your birth don't change the fact that you are a human being. Roland Warren argued that abortion arguments resemble those for slavery. In slavery, they said, your birth determines your worth. Supporters of abortion and slavery both subscribe to the notion that how you came into being determines whether one should be considered a human being in the legal sense. In other words, the circumstances of your birth determine your worth. That was the argument used for slavery and that is still being used today for abortion. Your circumstances, how you were conceived, determine whether you deserve to live. The second argument for slavery that's used for abortion is people are property. Slaves in the South, the unborn child is treated not as a separate and distinct human life, but rather as a property of the mother that can be killed with no legal consequences. That's exactly what they did during slavery. A slave is my property. I can do whatever I want with it. Same reasoning is applied to a fetus. It's my property. I can do whatever I want with it and I deserve to have 
a right for that. The third one is bodies are for sale. With slavery and abortion, there is a dehumanization and karma commercialization of vulnerable people. In other words, the notion that slaves and the unborn have intrinsic value is rejected and they have instead been subscribed as commercial value or economic cost. And the last one is vulnerable are worth sacrificing. If you think of slavery is illegal, you have the same basis to argue abortion should be as well. Just because abortion is legal, it does not make it right. Slavery, segregation and holocaust were all legal. It did not make them right. Now I understand maybe some of you will say, but Vlad, I'm pro-life personally. I'm just pro-abortion politically. It's like this, I'm personally against abortion, but I don't think it should be illegal. Women should have the right to choose, though I could never have the abortion myself. I know abortion is wrong, but the government should never leg legislate morality. We shouldn't force our religious beliefs on other people. Now let's apply the same thing to slavery. I'm personally against slavery. I don't think it should be illegal. I think people should have a decision whether they want to have slaves or not, but I'll never have slaves. I'm against that. Slavery is wrong, but the government shouldn't tell us what to do. We shouldn't force our religious beliefs on other people who want to have slaves. Slavery is wrong because it's another human being that is being subjected and treated like a property of another. And abortion is wrong on the same moral platform. Actually, it's even worse because with slavery, you're dealing with adults. With abortion, you're dealing with children. With slavery, you're not killing them. You're torturing them. With slavery, you're exterminating them. What does the Bible say? The last thing. The Bible tells us that life begins at conception. And I'm going to go quickly through this. God is pro-life. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Every person who read, Jews who read that verse, they knew what that meant. Have sex and make babies. Be married, make babies. God's people were pro-life. When Pharaoh wanted to kill babies, the Bible says midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved male children alive. They were saving children, not helping the culture throw them into the Nile. The unborn have legal rights. In Exodus 21 it says, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman, that her child comes out prematurely, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall be fine, as the woman's husband shall impose on him. And he shall pay as the judge is determined. But if there is harm, meaning if the child dies, you shall pay life for life. God forms us in the womb. Psalm 100 verse 3, it says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. And Job 31, 15, it says, Did He not made me in the womb? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? So what's happening there when that embryo becomes a fetus, there's a fashioning. That clump of cells become legs and start kicking and start breathing and start sucking and start hitting. God says in His Word, He fashions every child. Even non-canonical literature on Jewish wisdom demonstrates first centuries Judaism view on abortion. I'll mention one more is God knows us in the womb. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes have saw my substance being yet unformed. See, David is talking about himself. He didn't say somebody else was in the womb. He says, my, I was there, not yet formed. He's now referring to an it. He's talking about himself as an embryo. He's talking about himself as a fetus. He says, I was not yet formed, but that was me there. And in your book, all my days were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. 
Jeremiah 1 5, God calls us from the womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Even book of Enoch declares that an angel, evil angel taught humans how to smash the embryo in the womb. The first century Jewish historian Josephus wrote that the law orders all the offspring to be brought up and forbids women neither to cause abortion or to make away with the fetus. That is Jewish authors that are not even in the Bible talking about that the biblical worldview embraces life, children, not death. What about the New Testament? Children can worship in the womb. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the baby, that the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, Luke 1 41. Luke 1 it says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now I want you to watch this first. The Greek word for the baby here is not only used for the unborn baby in Luke 1 41, but it's also used for a newborn when the angel announced the birth of Jesus in Luke 2.12 and Luke 2.16. And the same word is used for children in Luke 18 verse 15. So the same Greek word that's used for the fetus is used for now the baby that's born and the angel tells the shepherds go and see the baby and then it's used for the children the parents bring to Jesus to bless them. So the Bible uses the same word for the fetus, for the newborn and for children. Interestingly, Elizabeth's baby leaped in her womb when Mary and her baby arrived in her house. Mary is called the mother of Jesus when she was pregnant not when she gave birth. That's the Bible. Elizabeth honored Mary's baby and didn't call him a fetus, called him my Lord. Meaning it's a person. That's the New Testament. And both women's unborn babies were living human beings. They were not choices. Like do I choose a salad or a burger? They were children already. The Greek word calls them children. The Bible uses this ideology that they are persons. Early Christians in Dadaki or Didachi 2.2 commends that thou shall not murder a child but abortion or kill them when born. A letter of Barnabas said you shall not abort a child nor again commit an abortion. Early Christians provided alternatives by rescuing and adopting children when they were abandoned. For instance, there was this guy who provided a refuge for abandoned children by placing them in Christian homes. Another guy would offer nourishment and protection to abandoned children, including some with disabilities caused by unsuccessful abortions. I hope that this becomes clear today for us, that God is pro-life. The alternative is not pro-choice, it's pro-death. Please, don't hide behind that SARF, SARF terminology. It's kind of like saying slavery is employment. It's not right terminology. We got to call it for what it is and I appreciate and I disagree with the liberal, uh, comedian, but I appreciate his level of honesty on that. Now in the conclusion, do you remember what I mentioned about Roe versus Wade? The law that became, made abortion legal. Let me tell you about this lady, Jane Roe. She got pregnant and claimed she was raped. Later on she said that was not true actually. Wanted to get an abortion, Texas law prohibited all abortions except to save mother's life. Norma thought it violated her rights. She filed a lawsuit for violating her rights. It went all the way to Supreme Court. 14th Amendment which protects person's right to privacy was extended to woman's womb, allowing her the right to end her pregnancy. Thus Roe versus Wade was made. Now interestingly, she later said she was never raped. She didn't become pregnant because of a sexual assault. So the whole law to slaughter millions of babies was based on a lie. 
She did come from a very rough neighborhood and family background. She was a victim of abuse, but it had nothing to do with her pregnancy situation. Actually, she never got an abortion because by the time it became a national law, she already gave birth to a child in Texas. Most of her life, she, exist, she existed on the edge of financial problems, dealt with alcohol and drug addictions. She eventually settled down with her same-sex partner, Connie, and that relationship lasted 35 years until she moved to a neighborhood and her neighbor was a pastor. A pro-life pastor and operation rescue leader, Flip, moved into the house next door. They reached out to her, they started to pray for her and they led her to the Lord. She got saved, she got baptized. And one of the most significant changes in her life was her genuine movement from pro-choice to pro-life. This is what she said, I was convinced that what I was doing was the right thing, but I was deceived. I deeply regret the role that I played in legalization of abortion. I've come to realize that life begins at conception and that abortion ends a human life. If you don't believe me, believe someone who put the law of abortion in motion. If you are here and you've committed abortion and you're coming here today to church and I'm going to give you a verse and I want to tell you that Jesus Christ forgives, saves, restores and redeems every sin. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The power of Jesus, He died for your sin. Whatever that sin is, whether you were deceived by the culture, whether you were embarrassed by the pregnancy that happened, whatever it is, it doesn't justify that it is sin. But it also doesn't change the fact there is a place for sinners like you and a sinner like me. It's at the feet of the cross. When we come, we experience forgiveness, we experience redemption and we move away from the cultural perception and view and we move to the crisis view. We love life, we love marriage. The sex is within marriage for the purpose of pleasure, procreation, comfort and intimacy and protection and we raise our families and train them in the things of God. Amen. I want you to rise to your feet. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to give an opportunity today to anybody who is in this room and have not given their life to Jesus. Maybe you're visiting today us for the first time. I'm pretty sure that this uh, came as a total shock of what the pastor was talking about. But I want to tell you that as a church we're not ashamed of the whole counsel of God and we preach God's Word with conviction and compassion. And if you are here, you don't know the Lord. He died for you. He shed His blood for you. Contrary to popular opinion that God killed His Son and now you can kill your child, it's not true. It's your sin that killed Jesus, my sin that killed Jesus and Jesus volunteered to let my sin kill Him so He can offer me mercy. He can offer you mercy. He shed His blood for you so you can be made new. If you would like to get saved, or maybe you are here today and you, you left the Lord, you left Christian faith and you went to, you went rogue, you, you went away, you forfeited that intimacy with God and today you're coming back to church for the first time or you're coming back, it's been a few times already and you're ready, you're ready to take that step and say, Jesus, you're my Lord, Jesus, I give you my life, forgive me of my sin, I want to be born again. Whether you're in that first camp, you would like to give your life to Jesus or you are in that second camp and you would like to return to the Lord. When I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. That's going to be your way of saying, I would like to be saved. One, two, three. Just slip that hand high. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. I see your hand. If you raise that hand right there where you are standing, just place your hand upon your heart. Say this out loud with me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, 
I believe you are the Son of God who died on that cross for all of my sin. I repent of my sin. Wash me with your blood. Give me eternal life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me new. I give you my life in Jesus name. If you pray that prayer, what's going to happen right now is I'm going to invite anybody else who needs prayer for anything, healing, deliverance. And you can come as well and one of our ministers will personally pray for you today. Today's altar call for salvation will look a little bit different because I want to invite all the ministers to step forward in both sanctuaries right now. So all the ministers that were scheduled to minister today, if you can step forward, there's not enough. If we can bring in more ministers today to step forward. If I can bring in life group leaders also that are available in the second sanctuary as well. As they step forward, if you need prayer for anything, you don't have to be a member of the church. You don't even have to be a Christian to receive prayer. When I close the service, I'm going to ask you to come to the center in both sanctuaries. Our ushers will guide you and we want to minister to you and pray for you for whatever need that you have in your life. Church, we want to remind you that as you exit today on Sylvester, make sure you exit right, not left to avoid creating traffic because I took a little bit longer so we have a little bit less time. So if you do that, that would really help us in both sanctuaries. Keep us in prayer this week as we pray for pastors conference and as we pray for our faith goal to raise $670,000 for electrical and plumbing. And now if we can put up the benediction, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. If you need prayer or you receive the Lord as your Savior, come to the center and we would love to minister to you.